All right. Well, Philippians chapter four. So let's go ahead. We kind of got a few verses into this already, but we're just going to back up, take the whole chapter at a time, and then ask some concluding questions on this letter from Paul. So, therefore, my brothers and sisters whom I love and long for my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Eudea and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. This has been a topic of great concern for Paul. He wants people in his churches to get along by being of the same mind. We talked about what that looked like. He says being of the same mind is to act like Christ, and to act like Christ is to be in service to one another. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. We talked a little bit about how there's not official church titles yet, but clearly women are involved in the organization of the early church. These people have been struggling for the work of the gospel. That's the term that would have been used, the work of the gospel, to talk to someone who's leading the church. It's kind of embarrassing, perhaps, that these two women are called out publicly because this letter is going to be read, uh, read in front of the entire church. And here their problems are called out in front of everyone. But Paul like we read in Isaiah, the leaders of the church are held to the same standards as everyone else. If they're not able to be of the same mind, then how can the rest of the church be of the same mind? And he tells them, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. This is an eschatological term. Remember that Paul and the early Christians thought that Jesus was coming any day now. And so not only is the Lord near spiritually, but they thought temporally as well. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. A beautiful injunction to give up anxiety. Easier said than done, of course. And then this is where we touched on briefly. Yeah, go ahead, David. Do you happen to know if anything is known about Clement? Yes, great question. And so I want to kind of get into this more in depth when we talk about like, what exactly after we read this letter, do we know? And so there is a very famous early church figure named Clement two of them actually, one from Alexandria and one from Rome, different time periods though. And so the, uh, this, these Clements have writings that we have. Um, one of these Clements is writing a letter on his way. Um, one, um, there's a letter written to Clement on someone's way to be executed uh, for their faith. But there is attempts to piece this Clement to one of those Clements but probably not. This is probably another Clement that we know nothing about. So great question. One problem with trying to do historical work with these names that are mentioned in Paul's letters is there are so many people with the same name. And mm -hmm. so you kind of make guesses of, could this be this person or this person or this person? And, and in reality, it's probably a completely different person. And so that's what we have going on here. Great question. Another interesting tidbit is there is a really strange word used for this phrase. I bet that's what this note says here. Yep. That could be someone's name. And so some translations leave that. Others translate it to my loyal companion. So again, there's hard work with names sometimes. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. As for the things that you have learned and received and heard and noticed in me, do them and the God of peace will be with you. On that last verse, who was it last week that said, I'm having a real problem with how much Paul is pointing to himself. Someone who was sitting right there, and I'm not remembering who it was, but we see that in verse 9. And, and for Paul, it's not too much of a theological problem. It's not 
he's not thinking about it. He's just thinking like, I am an apostle of Christ. I've seen the risen Lord. I'm starting these churches. Look at me. I've got it figured out. And we kind of wrestled with the idea of Paul as a human person with his flaws that he could be struggling with the egotism that has been kind of a, a mark of his own life throughout his time, even before his following of Jesus. What we didn't talk about last week to touch on briefly here is listing vices and virtues is common in several cultures, both Jewish culture and Roman culture. And so we get in Paul's letter where he'll list vices. These are the things to avoid. Do not lie. Do not do this and that. And it's also common to list virtues because virtues is at the forefront of how do you live a good life? Asking those questions of philosophy that we get when we study people like Aristotle or Plato and Socrates is what does the good life look like? What does it look like to be our best selves? And there are virtues that we should pursue that what is true or honorable, beautiful, pure, pleasing, anything. Those are the virtues that lead to a good life. And so Paul is playing on that idea of here are the virtues of Roman society. And at the same time, this is what we pursue as people of faith. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that Paul's really concerned that the churches don't make too much of a hubbub because he doesn't want to draw attention to this, in his mind, not necessarily new, but certainly not worshiping the Roman gods. And so he doesn't want to draw attention. And so he wants them to behave in a way that would be acceptable societally. And he's also kind of playing on that idea of the virtues of what a good life looks like. We do live those out as people of faith because when we're rooted in Christ, that's what Christ is like as well. So it's a, what could you call this? Could you call this syncretism? Sure. Um, I know when we were studying Isaiah and we came across passages and we kind of stepped back and say, hey, What's going on here is total co-option of other ancient Near Eastern religions. They're saying the same things, or they're describing God in the same ways that they're describing other ancient Near Eastern gods. What do we do with that? What do we do with the fact that Paul's playing on Roman philosophy? Something that I, I think we shouldn't be afraid of. I think it's okay to use the terms and lingo of the culture at large to say what's happening in the world of course, has something to say about God or God has something to say about what's happening in the world because God is God over all the world. There's nothing that can develop in our culture and our philosophies that isn't in conversation with who God is. Does that make sense? So I don't think we need to be afraid that Paul's bringing Roman philosophy into his explanation of Christianity. That's going to be what a lot of early Christians do. Um, when the Gospel of John starts out, in the beginning was the word. That Greek word is logos, major Greek philosophical term. And so the early Christians are playing with that and saying the logos, the energizing force in the universe that we've been talking about all these centuries, it's Jesus. And so they'll use Roman and Greek philosophy to talk about their faith. Any questions on that passage? Yeah. Mm -mm, take account of. Um, so why is that an important footnote? If there's anything excellent and if there's anything worthy of praise, take account of these things. I'm just thinking about this is a question, but I, I feel like there's some um, like right, have said to me, you should only think about holiness, like you find pure and sort of not make Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Um, we talked about how Paul uses, he's using a lot of terminologies from other fields and he uses a lot of economic language. So I wonder if that's why they put that footnote there is that um, in terms of economic terms, you're kind of taking an accounting of your life and Things that are pure and honorable and pleasing and just and commendable, hopefully those outweigh on a ledger um, kind of the 
the negative aspects. And so with that translation, it might be kind of a, a more realistic understanding of our mind is not going to be solely um, on those terms, but hopefully in the balance, it leans more towards this. It could also connect to this thing like what's coming up next about the Philippians, the Philippians is give. Ooh, and yeah. That, that thing at the end of chapter two, where he's saying that, uh, uh, what was it, uh, his messenger? Uh, Ephraim, Ephraim. Yep, Ephraim. Like that's, that's, that, that he's been there for me when you guys had uh -huh. um, Which kind of, I was wondering, uh, uh, how is it that he's doing his fundraising? Like, you know, early different highs and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, so for those online, Ben was saying, perhaps if we're using economic language here, it's tying into the next passage that we'll get to, where Paul's talking specifically about a gift given to him, or not given perhaps, by the church in Philippi. And Ben was connecting it to a previous verse where he says, hey, this guy Epaphroditus, you should receive him because he was there for me when you weren't. And so Ben's question is, what does... Um, what does fundraising look like here? So mostly um, it's, it's room and board is what Paul's getting when he's traveling. And so there is an early Christian text called the Didache, which is really interesting to read. Anyone can look this up. It's available online. But it's basically kind of like a, um, a, a, a church handbook on how do we function as an early church. What days should we fast? And so they talk about, well, these people fast on these days, so maybe we should fast on these days instead to kind of distinguish ourselves from this other group. And then how do you know whether someone is a, a, a false teacher or a true teacher? And should we be supporting them financially and giving them money? Um, and Because the risk of that is like we're kind of giving money to these people and they're not doing the work of God. And so how do we know how to control our finances? And so kind of the idea is like, you know, give them room and board is basically what's happening. Um, a lot of these folks were bivocational. And so Paul is also a tent maker. And so sometimes as he's traveling, he'll stop and he'll hang out with fellow tent makers, make some tents, get some money that way. Um, and then he's also collecting offerings from church to church that he wants to send back to Jerusalem in order to help those who are impoverished. So basically uh, he's wanting all these churches to support poor Christians who are in bigger cities. So that's kind of a few different aspects of fundraising going on. Um, in, uh, I think it's in Corinthians, he mentioned that he robs other churches. He robs other churches. So that's not ringing a bell. I wonder if, uh, Let's look that up and if you robs it to pay other churches, uh, kind of like a Robin Hood mentality. As, as, I mean, I, my, my take on it, and I may be way off here, oh, please. is that um, I'm, I'm kind of still looking through the lens of the uh, 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 Paul and James split mm. and the, the question of legitimacy and authenticity, like uh, of succession and leadership. And um, that, uh, you know, if somebody's fundraising in the name of the Jesus movement or whatever, then is that money really legitimately supposed to go to somewhere else? And, um, you know, maybe it's also a way of, of fundraising. And maybe it explains why he's in prison, because, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't really say. Yeah, yeah. No, he doesn't say here exactly. And so that's scholarly guesswork. So Ben's question was, um, you know, just kind of thinking about the historical split between folks who were following Paul or who were following James, um, kind of the idea versus grace, righteousness and works righteousness. And Ben was wondering maybe some some issues around fundraising and how those funds were used is not only the cause of the split, but why Paul's in prison. Yeah, those are really interesting questions. It was the second time he wanted to say, yeah, he's going to other churches to, or to do youth service. So what's the verse? Second Corinthians 11. I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. Ah, okay. So um, you read a verse second from Second Corinthians saying, um, went to other churches and kind of robbed them in order to do you service. Yeah, interesting. Um, 
what does he mean by that? I don't know. Yeah. And is it just kind of reallocating funds where he thinks they're better used? And so he's kind of taking on the role of treasurer of the early church and feels like this kind of ties into our discussion of Paul really thinks highly of himself if he thinks he knows exactly where the money should be spent. But yeah, good questions. Is that where Rob here? Pay Paul to pay Paul. That's a really good question. Yeah. I don't know. I'm going to look that up this week. Yeah. What the origins of that phrase are. Huh. Any other questions? All right. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I'm referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry or having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share in my distress. You Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been paid in full and have more than enough. I am fully satisfied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, ben, the conversation with you just now clearly puts a different lens on this conversation. And I think it just kind of highlights how sensitive and problematic issues around faith and money are. Because, of course, if what is being talked about here is, is real, if these people are sharing their resources, they're supporting one another. When Paul's in prison, they're making sure he has what he needs. They're gathering funds and sending it to Jerusalem to help people who are poor. If it's happening the way it should be, that's kind of a beautiful example of the reality of what Christian faith could look like. But when he says... To them, um, I, you know, I'm satisfied now that I've received your gift. It's a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. You know, using a lens of could there be corruption here? We know how easily corruption around finances can happen in the church. And um, thinking of folks like, did anyone watch the documentary on Marjo? No one's seen that? Oh, my gosh. It is fascinating. Um but it's, it's a young man who his parents were traveling evangelists. And so he just grew up in that world. And he did a documentary kind of behind the scenes as an adult. That's all he knew. And he, as a child, would do like child preaching. And he was really good. And so he kind of takes cameras behind the scenes. He's like, look, I've known all my life this is fake. I do this to get money. You can kind of come see. We bring in a lot of money. And you can kind of see how I do my whole operation. Like, how I pretend to do this and why I say that and kind of does a behind the scene looks uh, look of, um, of traveling evangelists from earlier days. So really fascinating. What's that called? Um, his name is spelled in a unique way. So let me just look it up together here. <coughs> okay. M-A-R-J-O-E. The documentary was made in 1972. Um, so I really hope this operation is above board, but we've seen pastors who say that, give me your money and it will be a sacrifice pleasing to God and you will be blessed tenfold for what you give to the church and it will be paid back to you. And this is what God wants you to do. And so you've got to be really careful around money issues. Um, I'm thankful to be in a church context where we've got a lot of controls around money, a whole handbook of how money's touched. And I never touch money. Um, it goes into a safe and other people count it. 
Um, and so, and you as a congregation get to see the budget and where all the dollars are spent. You know, that's really important. Um, all right, let's back up a second here. So let's just touch on this. Have folks heard that verse before? Yeah. It's kind of one of the prime proof texting verses that'll be on your bumper stickers and on your license plate. Um, lovely idea that's used to say, like, I can win the Super Bowl because God has given me strength and I can do all things through God because God gives me strength. It's really encouraging. And, you know, obviously I think that the spirit of God within us is moving. It's doing so much. It's giving us peace, which transcends all understanding. It's giving us comfort. It's trying to take away our anxiety. Um, but this clearly isn't meant to be tied to the concept of achievement of I can achieve anything I set my mind to because God wants me to do that. Um, you know, we know that life doesn't necessarily work that way, but of course we are strengthened in the spirit and given, given the ability to get through our challenges. Um, but when you kind of widen the context a little bit, Paul's speaking about the fact that he's able to continue his ministry regardless of the resources available to him, that he knows what it's like to be in a situation where he has very little. And he knows what it's like to be in a situation where he has more than he needs. And he's learned to be content in those situations and to continue to carry on and do his work regardless of what he has. And so he's kind of doing what he did in the verse you mentioned earlier, Ben, when he said, like, he was here for me when you weren't. Like, look, even if you didn't come through, I would have been okay. So don't think that just because you gave me this gift, you have saved me. I would have been okay. But um, you were there for me, and, and, I, and I, I thank you for that. He's playing with philosophy again here. The word of I have learned to be content is a word that's used in stoicism, which was a philosophy dealing with how do we moderate our emotions? How do we live in this world? And so that philosophy of learning to be content in all things. Well, Paul's taking the ideas of stoicism and saying, well, we're content in all things because through Christ, we always have whatever we need. So we've talked a lot over these last couple of weeks about perhaps this letter is piecing together several letters and scholars would point to the end of this uh, part of chapter four to say, maybe this was the end of the letter at some point, because there's a benediction here to our God and father be glory forever and ever. Amen. A very common benediction. End of letter. And then maybe there was another benediction from another letter that got added on to it. But we don't know, of course, but something that scholars will point to. So he ends the letter, greet every saint in Christ Jesus, the brothers and sisters who are with me, greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of the emperor's household. Uh, interesting phrase here. Paul probably was not familiar with actual family members of the emperor, but this term is used to refer to anyone engaged in the civil service of Rome. And we already mentioned that there are indications that there are people in the church of Philippi who themselves are pretty high up in terms of Roman service. And so he may be speaking directly to them. They are part of the emperor's household because they work for the Roman government, not because they're family members of the emperor. And then one of Paul's common benedictions, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So grace and peace be unto you is something Paul will often say. Um, any comments or questions about these verses? Okay, let's dig into some bigger picture questions. Um, just first off, any initial reactions to the letter of Philippians? Or thoughts that you've been thinking about or wrestling with over the last couple of weeks? <clears throat> 
Yeah, I think I read about this that it isn't known where he wrote this letter from. And they think that it, this is an early letter. So this isn't from when he was in prison in Rome. Correct. But do they, is there a theory or do they know where the letter was from? Yeah. So this is a separate imprisonment and mm -hmm. it is not certain exactly where he was or where he was in prison. And so there's evidence pointing to perhaps it was his time in Philippi that led to his arrest. And that's why there's a strong connection between this letter and the church in Philippi. It could have been other regions um, in Asia Minor, Ephesus. So unsure. So that's a, a good question, but it is not his final imprisonment in Rome. Yeah, this is an early letter. And in the divisions of what scholars are you know, really sure that Paul wrote and what they question. This is kind of in the for sure camp. What have you learned or what questions do you still have about ancient letter writing and how those letters wind up in the Bible? Has that sparked any questions for you? What does it feel like to be privy to an ancient conversation, a one-way ancient conversation? This is just a question to what you just Yeah. I hope this is an uncomfortable question. I just so appreciate this conversation um, as sort of the opposite of the question, which is, you know, he says, I can do all this. Look at the sentence before you know, the context of this. He's not saying, you know, it's a car, it's a all the stuff that I just thought you were about. Yeah. And, and I just I think about how available these cars and offices were to strangers. You know, you would think it's like a year at all. Yeah. Um, and so, so much of the work that you do to change us is just that as well. That's like the way you want that. It's just But there's such a tendency to make that a simple, yeah. uh, a pure, uh, something to sit on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really, thanks for sharing those thoughts. So, Kevin was saying, the work we're doing in this Bible study is attempting to be the opposite of proof texting to where a lot of these verses can lend themselves <laughs> to simplistic aphorisms that we might put up on the bathroom mirror, but understanding that they're coming from a larger context and then putting them in that context and how that complicates the discussion actually lends to the richness of the discussion. I would agree with that. And um, you know, that's something I struggle with pastorally uh, because there's a lot of those religious aphorisms that I don't agree with. Like everything happens for a reason, you know, give me an hour to talk about the theology behind that. And hopefully we'll help you understand that that's not true either. But I hate taking that from people um, because when you're in a moment where you kind of need to say to yourself, like, this is a really tragic event with no explanation. Maybe there is a greater reason and God's putting me in this for some reason. And that can be really rewarding. So there's a place for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because there is a truth to that. And then there's also a place for saying, now, wait a minute. Our faith is deeper and richer and more complicated than that. And... Um, it's still there for us in those moments when I didn't have the strength to do that. What happened? Well, then we can take a step back and talk more in depth. So I really like that. I think there's a, yeah, a place for both. And I like what you just said, Brian. I think Dante talked about the seven brothers. It's like when you get to the next one, just when Brothers are talking about this, and it just makes it richer and more. If there's a way that the, the simplistic version might be well, 
Yeah. 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 Oh, that's great. So Kevin, literary scholar over here, uh, saying you know, Dante says there are seven layers of interpretation, and when you get to the next one, it doesn't obliterate the one before that. I think that's absolutely true, and that is um, such has such a rich history within the Christian tradition. Um, and that I want to tie into my next question, and what, what the tie-in here is uh, the early, the church has wrestled. This is why I get really frustrated in conversations with biblical fundamentalists because they believe that the fundamentalist interpretations of scripture are the ancient interpretations of scripture. And they're not. Ancient Christians, the early church, were doing some wacky interpretations. They were all about allegories and everything was an allegory. And so they had different modes of how you interpret it. You had your literal interpretation, but then you had this kind of interpretation and this kind and this kind, and they all communicated with each other, but there were different ways of looking at scripture. So the idea of fundamentalist readings is really recent, rooted in kind of great awakening type mentalities. And so um, that's the frustration for me is I, I think a lot of American Christianity thinks it's rooted in the ancient church when it's really just rooted in you know, the last couple centuries of American Christianity. Um, but we talked about, and Kevin, you were the one who gave us this language, which was spot on when we were in our first week. One of the major questions we ask ourselves when we're reading the letters of Paul is, is this universal and normative? Is it something that applies to all people at all times and all situations? Meaning is what Paul wrote to these people applicable to us today here in Southern California, or is it something that is more local, historically situated, that only speaks to one problem for one people at a certain time? That's a really big question to ask. And I'm wondering, after going through the book of Philippians, how do you start answering that question? Or what tools do you feel like you have to answer that question? Yeah, Robin? Please. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, whatever committee believes the letter that was speaking to the Bible yeah. was part, I mean, I think it's part of the philosophy system who wrote this committee. Some of it, I think, is just going to have a wider application. It's, it's really just about, you know, cleaning out the pantry and making sure things are done in group or, you know, that stuff is up on the computer, you know, that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So um, Robin was saying when people were making decisions about what to put in the canon of scripture was one of the criterion that it had universal application. Um, there was a criterion very close to that, which was, is this book universally used? meaning are multiple regions reading the same book. Um, so that kind of ties into that. So they were doing that work in terms of like, we're reading this because it doesn't just apply to Philippi, doesn't just apply to Asia Minor, doesn't just apply to Rome. We're all reading it because we all think it has application to us. So I would answer that question with yes. So when it's kind of spelled out, in terms of what were we doing and what were we looking at, that's how they phrase it. Um, but I think that that's part of it. Yeah, great question. I feel like this ties into a previous question about um, what is the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians about looking at one one correspondence. Was it really though what the twenty correspondence wasn't always in the back of Paul's mind that? These documents might be shaping the church as a whole. I mean, writing a letter was a lot harder in those days. A letter had more significance than one of itself. So, written that would apply to the universe. Yeah, yeah. So, Chris's uh, question and statement is hard to write a letter in that time. And so, doesn't Paul have his eye towards the fact that it's not just going to be read by one community? 
Um, yes and no. So Paul certainly understands that the letter is going to be read aloud, even read aloud in worship. In the house church, you're going to sit around and it's your day to get together for worship. And part of the worship is reading Paul's letter. He understands that that letter is going to be saved. You're not just going to throw it away. You're going to want to reread it and remind yourself of it and maybe even read it again another time when new people have arrived and they have questions. And then you say, well, let's sit down and read Paul's letter to us, which answers some of those questions. So... Does he think that they're going to be circulated to other churches? Don't, I, don't, I don't know. Um, he certainly makes reference to other churches in his letters to churches, so they know each other, they're in conversation with each other. So there's definitely an element of that, that Paul understands that what he writes is going to be read Um and he's going to speak to specific issues like he does here. Like the church in, we don't know what the issue is. The church in Philippi conceivably knows. But if the church in Rome is reading this, they'll have no idea what it's about. So he's not writing necessarily with an eye to that. But he does know that his letters are going to be saved and shared. So that plays a role in it for sure. Other thoughts? Yeah, Ben? Uh but uh, just like to the question of just Philippians, um, I, I, I find it hard to read it in isolation. Uh, I feel like it has a lot more meaning in context. Uh, and I don't know, I, 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 when I was a kid growing up, I was very distrustful of Paul and I, I killed him. But even just learning like the fact that some of these epistles are literal Pauline and like, the household. Uh, you know, code and stuff like that. I just think really think about him, even though I feel so suspicious. Um, but uh, also, uh, not just in the context of the other epistles and, and acts, but also like, um, you know, the, uh, uh, Josephus, you know, or um, uh, the, the, the Gnostic Gospel, the Nagamite Scroll, and stuff like that. And that also gets to this issue of legitimacy, and I'll have this issue kind of struggling with it too. Um, and I, I, I'm not as concerned about that, but but uh, I, obviously people are with the fundamentalists today and back then, you know, there's struggles in, uh, around legitimacy. Um, but I think that uh, so I'm not as concerned about what got in, what it is in, because I think it's all worth studying, uh, whether it's you know Thomas or or, or whatever. I think it can all all of the literature helps us understand something about uh, the time that people were writing these things and their understandings of their own uh, spirituality and their relationship with the divine and you know their heritage and a lot of other things. I find that uh, it's valuable. I just, I feel like it's brought out when and you can see it in a, like a panorama of everything more so than just one. Yeah, one, one, one yeah, absolutely. Um, so to, reflect on that is you're naming um, a type of biblical criticism that scholars feel is very important and it's called canonical criticism which is you have to be able to read a book in the context of the entirety of the bible what is the conversation about these themes throughout all of scripture or even throughout all of extra biblical literature outside of scripture and so that's something that people would say is really important is you can't just understand one book in isolation. It has to be in conversation with everything else. And I, I, I love what Ben's saying as kind of a concluding word for us, which is um, even as we're asking these questions of what is universal and normative, um, I think digging deeper into the book of Philippians certainly complicates those questions for us. It's not airtight. We talked about trying to bring a lens or a frame to how we answer those questions and my suggestion is always Jesus's words of love God, love others is the frame. If something helps us love God and love others, then it's universally applicable. If it doesn't, then it's we have reasons to ask what the context is that might limit it and its scope. Um, 
but it's not airtight here. It's not airtight because we don't have the full conversation. It's not airtight because we are piecing together. Like what was the issue with these two women? We don't know. We don't, we don't understand everything. And so we come to that question, realizing that it's complicated, but nonetheless, as Ben's saying, there's value in, in everything that we read. There's just, I think, a lot of spiritual goodness to this letter as well. Even if we can't answer those questions with complete clarity, um, I think there's a lot that we can draw from that we can say, this feels pretty universal and normative. The idea to not be anxious about anything, to rejoice in the Lord, to take the nature of Christ, which is to empty ourselves in service of all. There's a lot of richness to this letter that I think can inform our spirituality and our relationship to God. Any concluding thoughts or comments? Okay, so we are going to pick back up on January 7th. So that's two Sundays off. Um, that's Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. And pick back up on January 7th. Um, but let me just close this with a word of prayer. Uh, God, we thank you so much for what has been four weeks, one month of digging into this little letter from Paul. Uh, we pray that we, through our reading of these words, we can come to understand what your word is, that we can live into the calling you have placed upon our lives, as Paul taught us in this letter. As we work that out, with fear and trembling, may your spirit be guiding us into a fuller realization of who you are and what you are doing through us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. See everyone in worship.